Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today for our Parenting During COVID-19 Lecture Series. I'm Georgia Weston, the Executive Director of Creative Healing for Youth in Pain, or as we like to call it, CHIP. We are a nonprofit for youth with chronic pain and their parents, providing exposure to creative healing experiences and social support online to reduce common healthcare barriers like cost and location. Not everyone has insurance or transportation or equal access to pediatric pain clinics. And that's why we provide these resources online. We also know that healing doesn't have to just take place in a hospital or a doctor's office. You can help yourself feel better in your own home. And creative healing means different things to different people, but it's all about finding joy in activities that assist with your healing process. And for some people, this means art, music, yoga, meditation, cooking, walking the dog, whatever makes you feel good. Because we know that these techniques can help reduce an overactive nervous system and increase functioning. And as I mentioned, the social support component is something that we are passionate about because so many of these kids and their parents are suffering in isolation. So instead of just giving them statistics about all the other people out there with chronic pain, let's introduce them to each other, letting them connect and support one another from a peer perspective. And that's what CHIP is all about and online so anyone can participate. Thank you for joining us today. We have a great presentation lined up, followed by a Q&A afterwards. Once we go to share the screen, your view may change depending on your settings of your Zoom account. So in the upper right corner, you can make adjustments as needed. If you have one rectangle up there in the upper right corner, you will just see yourself. Or if you click to where you have two rectangles, you should be able to also see Dr. Nielsen along with the presentation. So. We would also like to ask that everyone keep themselves muted and cameras off so we can enjoy the presentation. Uh, and so we will get started. Dr. Karen Nielsen is a professor of clinical pediatrics in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at UCLA Children's Hospital. She will be discussing COVID-19 in children and what we know to date. So right now I will take a moment to here we go and I will make you the spotlight video, Dr. Nielsen. There we go. And well, Rita, take it away. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, so we can get started. Um, the, I am, uh, my name is Karen Nielsen. I'm a professor of clinical pediatrics at UCLA. Um, I'm in the Division of Infectious Diseases and I've worked with uh, viruses pretty much for the last, uh, almost 30 years um, since I've been at UCLA and I've worked a lot with HIV and Zika. And now we are dealing with the COVID-19 epidemic. So today I'll be talking to you about uh, COVID-19 in children. I hope everyone can see my screen. And I think this is just a summary of what uh, I'll be discussing briefly, a little bit about the virus and what is the SARS uh, coronavirus 2, the pandemic, um, how many people died, what are the cases, what are the common symptoms of COVID-19, and how does that compare between adults and children? And that leads us into why is the disease usually mild in children? Then I'll go a little bit into some uh, different symptoms that children tend to have, which are distinctive from adults, which is uh, such as loss of sense, you know, sense of smell and taste, and also the COVID rashes. Then I'll talk, uh, briefly about this rare complication of COVID in children that we've been reading about a lot, which is this multi-system inflammatory syndrome, and I'll discuss that briefly. Then I, um, there will be some information about mother-to-child transmission, uh, whether children should wear masks, uh, how about pets and can they transmit the virus, and also briefly we'll touch on the effects of isolation and social distancing, um, also effects on children and their parents as well. So that's the summary of what I'll be discussing uh, with you today. Now let's start with the virus. So coronavirus has its name because of its shape. It has these spike proteins. Um, this is an electron microscopy uh, rendition of the virus, which gives us this um, appearance of a solar corona. Actually, um, in the world of viruses, it's called an RNA virus, and it has an envelope. 
Uh, this envelope is what we destroy when we use soap or detergents. Um, the virus has a nuclear capsid in the center, and it's one of the largest uh, RNA viruses that exist. And uh, the genome is about 26 to 32 um, kilobases, but that means you can actually have billions of viruses on the, on the head of a pin and you still can't see the virus. So even though it's a big virus, it's relatively tiny. So um, coronaviruses are abundant in nature. In fact, this epidemic, as we all know, came from animals, um, other mammals to humans, but it's also um, prevalent in birds. And uh, most coronaviruses cause the common cold um, in, in humans, but there are specific coronaviruses like the SARS virus, the MERS virus, and now the SARS coronavirus too, which causes more severe disease. But um, coronavirus can also cause disease in animals. Birds can have coronavirus, but there are different types of coronavirus, not the ones that we have. Cows and pigs can also have diarrhea due to different kinds of coronaviruses. And this here, I put a picture of, a, of an eclipse of a solar corona, and, and this is um, where the viruses um, were named. Um, um, it was actually a scientist lady who first saw this virus in Canada under electron microscopy and, and called it a coronavirus because that's what she um, thought of when she looked at these spike proteins. So uh, this is just briefly just to show that um, there are seven classes of uh, seven types of coronaviruses that can infect humans. Um, there are the three serious ones that we talked about uh, with uh, SARS coronavirus 2 being the current virus, but there are these other four viruses that circulate every year. The first time, uh, the first one that was identified was in the 1960s. And these viruses circulate yearly Round about children have six to eight infections with these viruses a year. They generally cause a common cold. So, so we have actually been living with coronaviruses for quite a, a long period of time. So the pandemic, of course, we live in a connected global world and wherever you have an infection, we, we saw how this virus very quickly spread and reached all of us. And uh, this is just a diagram from the Chinese CDC, actually, and, and then um, this was endorsed by our own CDC here. But as that, so you can see, um, it, the disease was first identified in December 2019 when they were reporting these cases of unusual pneumonia. By January, um, the WHO was notified. By January 7th, the virus was identified, and uh, the problems associated with this virus were quickly reported to the WHO. And um, by January 20th, it became a notifiable disease. And by the 23rd, uh, the city where it first um, was recognized, which is Wuhan, was shut down, and then adjacent cities were shut down. So it was actually very quick, um, so to speak. This is data from today um, from the Johns Hopkins uh, website. It's actually a very interesting site to look at the number of cases. And we are now at almost 5.2 million cases with 335,000 reported deaths word worldwide. And, and this is sort of a heat map of how many cases are reported worldwide. As you can see, almost 100,000 cases, new cases are reported every day. And here are the number of cases by country. And I calculated here the mortality rate for, for you to see. Um, in the US, the general mortality rate is for reported cases is 6%, similar to what's reported right now in Brazil that has a, also an ongoing epidemic, 6.5%, but less than what we have seen in Europe where the United Kingdom has a, a death rate of about 14%, similar to Italy, similar to Spain, France, even higher mortality rate. Germany has taken um, a lot of precautionary um, measures. Their mortality rate is actually 5%. And as you can see, there's a large variability. And there are many reasons for this. This is a whole another talk in, in itself. But I just wanted to say that mortality, mortality will vary depending on the number of older people living in the population because a mortality with this virus is very age dependent. The older you are, the more prone you are to get it becoming very sick in this specific disease. It, it's sort of different from influenza. Um, the mortality of countries also depends on how many um, older individuals are living in, in those countries. Some 
countries that are more resource limited actually have a much younger population in general. So they actually might have lower mortality rates because they don't have as much older people. And this was like a report that um, I, I participated in when this epidemic first uh, began calculating also the incubation period. We, we, we reported, we wrote a letter to the Lancet ID saying that the, the mortality probably was around 5.7% in general uh, at that time. This seems to have been years ago, but it was actually in March. Um, the mortality was quoted at one to two percent, and now we have been seeing higher cases of mortality. Um, also, to understand this better, we need we need to remember that this all depends on how much you're testing. Because if you don't test um, anyone, um, you're not you're going to have a higher mortality rate because you're only going to identify the ones who are very sick. If everyone is tested, then you have a much larger de denominator and that will bring your mortality rates down. So this is a dynamic um, figure. But as you can see from the first cases in China, um, the mortality of this condition of this disease is, is spikes after age 50 and, and climbs very rapidly after age 80. So definitely older individuals are more susceptible to um, having bad outcomes from, from this disease. But then uh, when we look at all these curves, sometimes it's hard to tell how many of these cases are really in children. And I, I looked at the literature for the United States and the most recent report that we have is from April from the CDC. And at that time of all the cases reported to date in the, in the United States, only 1.7% uh, of the COVID cases were in children, meaning by child, someone less than 18 years of age. Uh, Close to 60% of the children were boys. So, and we've seen this all over that um, even in older adults and, and so forth, that there, the disease seems to affect slightly more males than females. And we can go into this later. But uh, um, importantly, most, most children, the vast, vast majority of children had very mild disease and that was recognized. And, and when you look at, at these blue bars here, this is from the CDC report. It was the children under one year of age who had the highest rate of admissions to the hospital and who tended to get uh, the sickest, but they actually were not the most frequently infected. The most frequently infected age group was children between the ages of 15 to 17 and then 10 to 14. And as you can see here, the distribution uh, of uh, infections in children. But this is a very small proportion of patients considering the whole epidemic. It's only 2% of the cases of, of COVID in the United States. Uh, in terms of coronavirus deaths, the data is also pretty reassuring. Um, it was a very limited number of deaths in, in, in children zero to 17 years of age. This was a report from the New York City Health Department in, in mid-May, so it's fairly recent. So a very small number of deaths. There were nine deaths for all the cases that they identified. And, and, and then as you can see, as you move up, the death rate increases as you grow older. But um, six of the nine children who had died in New York City actually had um, underlying conditions. But there are only three patients that didn't have any other underlying uh, conditions that uh, succumbed to, to this disease. So uh, why don't children get as sick as adults is a question that everyone has been asking. Interestingly, um, I just want to say that um, uh, for transmission purposes, um, people are infectious uh, right in the beginning of illness, not as they get sicker and sicker and sicker and end up intubated in some situations, which is a small proportion of the population that they are most transmissible. People shed the virus early on and that's when they have most ability to transmit. So there are a lot of transmissions happening from people who don't have any symptoms or have very mild symptoms and, and that is true for children as well. So it's early in the disease process that people are most infectious. But why is a disease in infants and children different than in adults? Um, this is all theoretical, um, so I don't want to say that these are absolute uh, truths or, or, or anything like that, but the hypothesis is, and from this is from immunologists, is that because children are exposed to common coronaviruses, that, as we mentioned before, all the time, you know, they can have as many as eight infections a year, they actually have prior immunity from the other coronaviruses. And this immunity is not antibody immunity, it's what we call cell-mediated immunity. It's, it's, it comes from T cells. 
So um, when, when they're exposed to a coronavirus, their T cells are already ready to go to war. They're sort of primed by prior infections with coronavirus. And so they wake up and they fight the virus right away when, when they identify this, this virus. And so the younger you are, um, probably the more frequent exposures you have had. Parents of young children also tend to have more exposures. But these immune responses tend to go away as you age. And you know, it's, when it's 30 years ago that you last saw coronavirus, you're, you'll be um, more likely to become sick if you come into contact with one. So that's one of the hypotheses that there is some cross protective immunity in children because they get infected with other coronaviruses all the time. And then there's another hypothesis that there might be, um, um, issue, you know, the viral receptor site, which is the ACE. ACE2 receptor, which is what the virus needs to get into the cell to get to infect someone. The expression of this receptor is different across different age groups, and it's also different between males and females. So um, this is sort of interesting to know because with the other SARS virus, when we had the SARS virus outbreak and it started in China and then went to Canada, children also rarely became very sick. So this is something that is very typical of, of these SARS viruses. And, and we know for sure that the disease is clearly worse uh, in older people. So um, the, uh, these spike proteins that the virus have, they attach to these ACE2 receptors on the surface of the cells. And that's how they're able to infect cells and get into our body. And uh, this ACE2 uh, receptor, this is, a, the ACE2 is an enzyme and it controls the activity of a, of a protein in our body, which is called angiotensin II. And this, and this protein is really, if it's left uncontrolled, um, you can also have increased inflammation and you have damage to your blood vessels and all sorts of problems. So the virus actually binds to a critical receptor that is needed to control, you know, sev several uh, reg regulatory or several components in our body. So, so what is thought is that um, adults um, have more expression of ACE2 uh, receptors than children do, and males have more of these receptors, which are the keys that the virus turn, you know, Let's suppose that this is, is the lock and the virus is the key. These are, this is what the virus needs to infect a person. So this is sort of a, a science paper, but I just want to say that in children less than 10, you know, the virus first infects our noses. And these receptors to which the virus attaches, they're much less present in children as opposed to older adults. So that also explains why maybe adults are more susceptible to also becoming more infected with this virus than children are. So you have less infections in children, and if you do have infections in children, those two theories are opposite. They could all go well together. Children are less susceptible to becoming infected, and then um, the virus, once they become infected, they have better immune responses because their T cells have a good memory of a very recent infection. They get up and kill the virus before any damage is done. So that's the theory um, behind them. So signs and symptoms, uh, uh, how do children behave when they get infected uh, with this virus? So this is a, a description for adults. There's really no real symptom that discriminates um, COVID-19 from other respiratory infections such as influenza or adenovirus or RSV, all these other respiratory viruses that we have. You can have very mild symptoms. You can have a dry cough, you can have fever, or you can be feverish. Uh, some patients report diarrhea before uh, cough and fever. And the incubation period is short. It's usually five days, four to six days, but it can be as long as two weeks, but that's not very common, fortunately. And most people recover on their own without needing anything much, but we know that there's a percentage of the population that will have the complications we all have heard about, which are the pneumonia leading to respiratory failure and sometimes several organs in the body failing. Um, but that is actually a small percentage of patients overall. So this is a report from Italy, and I just want to, to highlight um, they're, they're, they're reporting children that had, that had coronavirus infection, and 100 children in the region of Bergamo where the big coronavirus outbreak happened. And 27% um, of the children that they identified actually also had co coexisting um, predisposing conditions. 
fever was present in 54% of them, 44% uh, of the children had cough, and about one out of every four children had a runny nose or, or had difficulty feeding. This is also similar to a report from the CDC of um, many more children, but they, they collected less individual information. So the baseline is that most children who have symptoms due to this infection, they have just common cold symptoms. They'll have a fever, a cough, a runny nose. They might have loss of appetite. This is very common in all the series that have been reported to date. Very much less common was shortness of breath or pneumonia in children. Now, having said that, the risk factors for having more severe COVID disease in children is similar to what we see in adults. If they have asthma, if they have obesity, obesity has been identified as a, as a big risk factor for um, COVID morbidity, um, underlying heart disease, underlying lung disease, diabetes. These are all factors that may predispose uh, children to having more severe uh, COVID disease if, if they get the virus. So in adults, of course, there's this percentage of patients, usually older patients, who will get this critical illness, which is uh, leading to respiratory failure. And uh, of course, uh, it's not only the lungs that can be involved, it uh, can also be the kidneys, the heart can be involved, the blood pressure can become very low, you can have liver involvement, and some patients can even have uh, neurologic complications, become very drowsy and so forth. Uh, also, there are a lot of clotting problems. Patients can have clots and blood clots forming everywhere. And I put here just to, so you could see what a CT scan looks like in someone who has this COVID pneumonia. This is a very typical CT scan here, and this is like a normal one. So, you know, these white spots here should not be present. But the reason that the virus causes all this damage is because it induces um, this dysregulated immune response. It's really the inflammation, the way our, our body reacts to the virus that really is very damaging um, and, and causes all the problems. And they, there is this syndrome called cytokine release syndrome. Um, cytokines are, uh, are proteins that are, are released from our T cells, which uh, modulate our immune system. And they're released like in a haphazard way and they trigger a lot of inflammation. And it is this inflammation that makes us very sick. In fact, much of the treatment of this disease has been uh, giving monoclonal, giving antibodies that actually make these cytokines stop working. And they're actually immune, um, they're immune suppressants because they stop the cytokines from working to reduce inflammation. So this is sort of an interesting aspect of this condition. So among the children who develop serious respiratory symptoms and they have a um, picture, you know, a clinical picture that's similar to what adults have. And this is a paper that came out from 25 uh, PICUs in, in the United States and Canada. And it's still a very small series of children. It's only 48 children. And these are 48 children who were admitted because they had pneumonia and difficulty breathing um, as adults did. But of these 48 children, it's important to note that 40 had severe pre-existing uh, conditions, which are listed here for you. So these were not children who were uh, healthy children to begin with. They were children at higher risk because of all these conditions that they had. Um, and, and this led, and this series of 48 children, two of the children died. But um, what we need to know is that the severe illness in children is much, much less frequent than adults. And as I said, all COVID cases are less than 2% in, you know, cases in children are less than 2% than what we see in adults. And there's a very small, small number of cases in children that actually could lead uh, children to becoming very sick. Um, I have to say that uh, we have had a minimum number of children admitted with, with COVID in, in the Los Angeles hospitals that required ICU care. Our epidemic has not been the same as in New York. So this is important to remember so that it's the pre-hospital uh, pre um, risk factors that appear to, to predispose uh, patients to having this more complicated COVID pneumonia that is also seen in adults. Now, having said that, um, there are some unusual symptoms that s seem to um, be more common in children and adults that, um, that have uh, COVID. And this is these rashes and these rashes on their toes, which are called chilblain-like lesions. And 
And sometimes they're the only symptom that um, these teenagers have of COVID. And there's some reports in the literature that, you know, the, the virus can cause rashes, it can cause hives, it can cause even chicken pox like blisters. That's all been described. But this is sort of something very typical. These are feet of teenagers, actually 14 and 11 year old uh, kids. And uh, they actually uh, start having these red lesions here. They can blister and, um, and they are painful. They can itch or they can burn. And usually that resolves without any treatment within a week to 10 days. But um, that this has been some, some of the way in which people have identified themselves as having COVID because they develop these lesions on their, on their toes. Another common um, finding, much more common in younger people as well, is the loss of smell. And with the loss of smell, you can also lose the taste. And these are fancy medical words for which mean there's anosmia, loss of smell, hyposmia, partial loss of smell. So um, it's really uh, been seen in patients who ultimately test positive for COVID, and it can actually be the only symptom. I know of a, a daughter of a friend of mine who's 20 years old, and the only symptom she ever had of COVID was she hasn't been able to smell for the last four weeks. And she was tested early on, and she was positive, and, and she's had, never had any other symptom. Uh, this will eventually return. We don't know when, but it, it eventually does return. What happens is that there's some damage to the nerves and the nasal cavity when the virus infects your nose. And that seems to cause um, the, the transient loss of smell. It's not because you have a congested nose. Um, actually, these patients don't have congested noses. But uh, it's interesting that when you get these inflamed nerve tips infected, the receptors on those nerve tips stop being able to detect scent molecules. And that's why you lose your sense of smell uh, with this virus. But it doesn't happen in everyone. And it's much more common in younger, younger people who are infected. Now. I'm going to talk quickly about what's been in the news right and left and what we're all worried about is this multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, also known as MIS-C. It can also be called PIMS. And uh, this was first noted in England, and this is a, 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 came from the New York Times. You know, New York had a very big outbreak of COVID, and, um, and this was identified there as well. So uh, the first report of this condition came from England and the United Kingdom where there were a lot of cases of COVID, but as you can see, very few children here had severe disease prior to any of the, of the COVID cases. The dark blue lines are the people who died. England, United Kingdom in general has had a very high uh, mortality due to this virus, but in older individuals, which is the pattern everywhere. However, um, this uh, in England, they call it PIMS, which uh, it, it's pediatric um, and, and not childhood, but it exactly means the same thing. As you can see in London here, you, were, you had all these cases of COVID, and then about a month later, you started seeing the, name, the number of cases in children. These are different axes here. Um, the cases are in the thousands, and the pediatric cases here are 35 or so of this multi-inflammatory syndrome. So it happens about a month later. And this is also in Italy. It's something that was reported this week in the Lancet. It's again from Bergamo. And uh, what they saw in Italy, as you can see, they had all these cases in Northern Italy. They had this very large number of what they thought was an atypical type of Kawasaki disease. Kawasaki disease is a is a relatively rare condition in children. It's what we call a vasculitis. It's an inflammation of blood vessels and, it, and it's typical, it causes fever, discomfort, and the fever doesn't go away. And if, if Kawasaki is untreated, um, it can cause coronary artery problems and, and lead to aneurysms and, and can cause cardiac involvement. And the Kawasaki disease is something that we know how to treat, but we don't know what really causes Kawasaki. Kawasaki is also caused by a dysregulated immune system. So it's an inflammatory response that goes wrong. And there are many diseases that can uh, trigger Kawasaki. So uh, what was seen in England was that there was uh, children who were febrile, who had some inflammation, and, and they had uh, um, SARS coronavirus infection. Then there were some children who actually had very typical Kawasaki disease, which was associated with this virus, and what happens is Kawasaki disease is triggered by, can be triggered by different viruses. We sometimes see Kawasaki disease um, with influenza or with other respiratory viruses. 
it causes fever, it causes a rash, it causes changes in the, in the skin, it causes swelling of the hands and feet. It's usually in children that are less than five years of age. It's usually in younger children. And when we started seeing a lot of Kawasaki disease cases, we thought, well, we have a very big epidemic here, pandemic with this new virus, um, because we have millions of cases of COVID, we're gonna see um, more frequently rare complications of viral infections such as Kawasaki. But then um, this Kawasaki disease that started being investigated, it was really not very typical of Kawasaki only. It, had, it sh shared some features, but it was different in other ways as well. So the CDC issued a, a statement, um, a recent statement, um, defining what is multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Kawasaki disease is not a disease that has a lab test you can run, it's a clinical diagnosis. And the same is for these multi-system inflammatory syndrome. So any, anyone who's less than 20, uh, 21 years of age and has fever and, la and labs that are consistent with inflammation and have a very severe illness that requires them to be admitted to the hospital, they have more than two organ involves, whether it's cardiac or renal or, or abdomen or, or so forth, respiratory, and they have no other diagnosis for this, and they've recently tested positive for SARS coronavirus 2 by any test, then um, they probably have this syndrome. And uh, this, is, is, this is the CDC statement. So what, what, what do children have when they have this multi-system inflammatory syndrome? So they have a high fever. Usually the fever is persistent for more than four days. Uh, a lot of children have GI symptoms, very severe abdominal pain. Um, they might have diarrhea or not. It's very frequent to have a rash. It's very frequent to have red eyes. The mouth will also get very red. They might have cough and they might be complaining of headaches and being irritable. All of this is very typical, in fact, of Kawasaki disease, except that the GI symptoms are not prevalent. However, they can also present with shock which is not so typical of Kawasaki. It's more typical of something called toxic shock syndrome, which is due to bacterial toxins. And, and they have very low blood pressure. And this is serious. When, when someone has shock, they have to be, into, you know, be admitted to the ICU. So this is how, how this syndrome presents. And this is from uh, Dr. Schneider from a, a series in, in New York. And uh, in this series, the median age of the children who had this, and, and this is 44 children only, um, in, in that hospital. Um, and the median age was eight years. And this is actually older age, which the Italians also saw that is seen in typical Kawasaki. Usually Kawasaki, the median age is four to five. Um, more common again in, in male children. 80% of these children actually had no underlying medical conditions. Some of them were obese, but 60% uh, were not. Some of them had asthma. And most of them had had fever for four days. Some of them had altered neurologic symptoms. Having abdominal pain um, was very, very common. Almost all children had it. Only half of them had respiratory symptoms and about two thirds had shock. But when, when you looked at Kawasaki disease criteria, two thirds of the children actually had uh, a, a disease that otherwise we would have called Kawasaki. But however, the shock was very prevalent in this population. So it was a very serious illness. Most of these kids actually needed to be in the ICU. Some of them were intubated, but not because they had pneumonia, but more because of the shock and the other complications uh, with the heart. However, um, reassuringly, even though this is a very serious disease and requires ICU care, there's been minimal mortality and most children have been discharged alive and symptoms have completely resolved. But it is very scary and it's very serious when it happens, but it seems to happen in a very small number of children. So going on, um, uh, I've been doing a lot of work in pregnant women with COVID. We actually have a study ongoing at UCLA and also in Brazil looking at the repercussions of this infection during pregnancy. Uh, I have to say that it's still very unclear if the virus can be transmitted during pregnancy for the, from the mother to the child. There have been some reports of the virus being um, found in the placenta, but that doesn't mean that the child became infected that way. Um, there are a lot of newborns who will have been found to be positive shortly after birth, but it's unclear if they were infected right after being born or during the birth process. 
Um, interestingly, the babies, the newborns who get the virus, they tend to do very well and they don't tend to develop pneumonia or need to be on the ventilator. However, they do shed the virus for a number of weeks, usually four weeks or more, and they shed it initially in the nasopharynx and later in the stool. Interestingly, um, just today I, saw, I came across this report published last night about uh, a, a woman who had the virus identified um, in, in breast milk. There's always concern that while you're expressing the breast milk, you might contaminate um, if you have an active infection, but this is a report out of Germany. It seems that um, they were very careful about that and the virus was found in the breast milk of this patient for several days. So if there is transmission through breast milk, of course, that's another mode of, of babies becoming infected, but this remains to be confirmed. So the answer is, is there vertical transmission? If it does happen, it seems to be very unlikely. And there's no evidence to date that the virus causes birth defects like Zika did, but of course we have to remember that this disease was first identified in January. So any woman who was exposed in the first three months of pregnancy to this virus has not delivered the baby yet. However, most of the ultrasound data has been reassuring. There's no, um, no idea that the, there will be birth defects associated with this. Having said that, the babies, of course, depend on their mothers and they're attached to their mothers. The fetuses are growing in. And if their mother is very sick with COVID, there will be repercussions to the fetus indirectly, not because the fetus has COVID, but because you know the blood flow to the placenta will be less. Any woman who goes um, to the needs requires intubation and gets very sick with pneumonia uh, is at risk of miscarriage and is at risk for fetal problems, not because the virus is being transmitted to the baby, but because the infection has a bad outcome for, for, for the mom and for her pregnancy. So, the, but there's a distinction, um, distinction there as well. So uh, this is just some papers, uh, just, just to um, emphasize that most of the babies born to women who have COVID don't get the infection. Uh, when they do get the infection, um, they, can, they can have very uh, mild findings. All the babies have survived it, and I have not come across any report of newborns dying from COVID-19. And again, this is just to emphasize that they actually shed the virus if they do become infected for quite some time, first from their nose and mouth, and then later from the stool uh, up to four weeks uh, of age. So changing, talking about um, shedding of the virus and so forth, should children wear masks? The CDC does recommend that children wear cloth face coverings um, if they're age two years of age or more when they're in the community um, because they could um, be asymptomatic carriers of the virus. But these masks should be made from household items and, and from common materials. Children should not wear surgical masks or N95 respirator masks by any chance. Of course, we should never mask babies and young toddlers. They have smaller airways and there is a big risk of suffocation. Also children who have disabilities or any developmental delay, they're also at risk of suffocation if we put masks on them. So we have to be careful because um, um, there is this choking hazard. So masks should not ever be put on by people who don't know how to remove them by themselves. And that's another reason why babies should not be masked. Um, another interesting topic for children, can pets transmit SARS coronavirus? I think most of us read about the lion in the Bronx, not lion, the tiger in the Bronx uh, Zoo, who was positive um, for COVID-19. We have to remember that this is a disease that came from animals to humans. So it's in medical terms, it's called a zoonosis. So we know that it can infect other animals, but there's very limited information available to date. So the CDC says that the that we're still learning from the virus, but the risk seems to be low and we should not worry about it too much. Um, there was a paper in the New England Journal uh, in which one cat was purposely inoculated with the virus and, and this cat was able to transmit the infection to two other cats um, that were living with it. So there is transmission there, but we have to remember that pets are, are great um, companions, especially when we are isolated. And from today's LA Times, uh, this uh, writer reminds us that a furry friend can do wonders and it will help ease stress, anxiety, and loneliness of life during the pandemic. So we have to balance that. Um, I would not advise getting rid of your pets because of COVID. 
So uh, finally, mental health of children during isolation. Of course, everyone knows that isolation is bad for everyone's mental health. It's actually a form of punishment um, in some situations. And so um, this was a report that came out of China, uh, almost 1,800 children who were between uh, second and sixth grade answered this poll. And uh, they applied this children's depression inventory short form in, in their questionnaire. And 23% of the children actually reported depressive symptoms. And when they were screened for child anxiety, about 19% of the children also described anxiety anxiety symptoms. So this is just um, one of many reports that have been uh, highlighting that children are becoming depressed and they have been showing much higher uh, anxiety rates than what is normal for this age group because of the pandemic. And many reports have confirmed this. Also, this is a report that was released last night from the American Psychological Association. It's online if you want to look at it, but it also shows that parents are experiencing very high stress levels related to COVID-19. This was a poll of uh, thousands of parents as well. And interestingly, uh, when you look at adults of the same age, 46% of uh, adults who were parents reported high average stress level related to the pandemic as compared to 28% of adults of the same age who didn't have any children. A non-parent had in the scale of one to 10, had a stress rate of about 5.5, whereas a parent had a stress rate of 6.7. And interestingly, um, having um, children homeschooled and online learning was actually a, caused a great deal of stress in many parents. 71% uh, of parents had said this was a source of stress. And you know, disruption to routines, adjusting to new routines overall, that was 74% um, uh, of parents had said that this was a source uh, of stress. Just as well. So, so as you can see, this, this is a major problem that we are living with, um, both children and parents. So um, just to finalize, um, I don't want to finalize on a bad note. This is not the end of the world. Uh, we know that pandemics are not permanent. Some epidemics are, but not pandemics. You know, HIV epidemic has been haunting us for more than three decades. However, uh, respiratory viral pandemics generally are not permanent. And as you can see here, this is a slide from the 2002-2003 SARS epidemic, which actually had a much higher mortality um, than the current epidemic does. Uh, um, however, that virus was less infectious than this one. Nevertheless, as you can see, um, cases start being seen here in January. They started peaking, and then by June, they were actually gone. But this was primarily in China and Canada. But we have uh, pandemics of uh, influenza. We had H1N1 epidemics and so forth. And all of these eventually go away. So there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And whenever we have an outbreak or an epidemic or a pandemic, which these are scales of magnitude higher, there will always be patient zero and uh, cases are detected. The interventions will begin in our cases, social distancing, self uh, quarantining and so forth. That was the early response. And then other interventions can happen, which could be vaccines if they are created, uh, you know, built fast enough or treatments or preventive treatments. And eventually, um, you'll have the last recorded case, and the end of the outbreak is declared. And post-intervention, you, you evaluate what were the lessons learned, what is the capacity building that we need for future situ similar situations. There's a lot that comes out of academic research. But in fact, there's a lot of that is coming out every day in terms of academic research, night and day on this virus. So it's even hard to catch up. Something from a week ago seems like it was 10 years ago. So we are moving forward. Um, I didn't go into the treatments, but I'm happy to answer questions. The treatments uh, for children are similar to that of adults. And I think this is the last slide. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Nielsen. So now we can open it up for questions. Um, everyone can feel free to go to the bottom of their screen where you should see a chat option. Um, and there, if you click on that, a little box will pop up where you can type in messages um, and then Dr. Nielsen can answer accordingly. We have one that's already in there. So if you want to get started with that, we can. Sure. 
Yes, when they open schools, do we expect uh, the number of cases to increase? Um, we don't have much data yet. Well, you know, the closure of schools has been criticized by some as, um, you know, uh, risk and benefit analysis in terms of, of the psychological damage you could do to kids from keeping them at home and, and, and the fact that then if they stayed at home in some situations, they could stay with grandparents and they would increase the risk of exposure. Um, children are just a small segment uh, of the infection as we saw. So it, it might be um, that we might see more cases of transmissions to adults I, um, because a lot of the children are asymptomatic. They might not be identified, but yes, as you have more exposures, you could have a rise in numbers. Having said that, in Denmark, um, about a month ago, they reopened schools and they kept social distancing in terms of uh, you know, the seats are very far away and kids can only play with one child at a time and so forth. There was some control. They have not seen a rise in the epidemic after they opened the schools. So what are the side effects of current treatment options? Um, the, recommend, the treatments recommended are generally recommended for patients who are very sick. Um, so um, we have rem remdesivir, which is an antiviral, which is uh, it's given um, actually IV. It's not given orally. And it is uh, usually recommended for patients who are admitted and need to be um, in the ICU. The, Hydroxychloroquine uh, situation is still open to debate. It actually seemed to make patients, some patients who were uh, critically ill worse because it has uh, cardiac toxicities. It's not currently recommended for treating children. Uh, treatment of children who get very sick requires supportive care. If they are if they are sick because of COVID pneumonia, they will get they are eligible to getting the antivirals that, that are available. Um, as I said, the, the main one is remdesivir, which is still an investigational drug, but it's available through compassionate use. There are also um, anti-cytokine blockers, which are used in adults and can have also been used in older um, adolescents or youth. Um, and there are a series of them that, that block the cytokine storm. Uh, for children who have this rare uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome, they're treated like having Kawasaki disease. So they get IVIG and they get all these series of um, treatments that are well known. And, and they actually have been very, um, you know, curative in, in most situations. So it depends on what stage of disease we're in. Um, but uh, we, we have to look at this um, carefully. Um, most of the treatments are only available for people who are critically ill. Uh, let's see. Are children with autoimmune diseases at greater risk? You know, the data on this is um, controversial. Uh, because some of them are on the cytokine blocking drugs already, um, uh, and the Kindra uh, and other drugs like that, actually, um, it doesn't seem like they, they might necessarily be at greater risk. We also thought that patients with HIV would be at greater risk, but that has not um, seemed to be the case yet. Having said that, this is a new disease and um, there are not enough cases to report, but, but it is interesting that the use of some immune suppressants actually seems to, to make the disease counteract the, the cytokine storm that is seen in this disease. Um, do you anticipate a second wave of COVID-19 during flu season? This was all depend if the virus is still circulating at that time or uh, if there are still cases around that can transmit. Um, I think it's a conjecture. Um, we know that with the big influenza, Spanish flu um, pandemic of 2018, there was a second wave. Uh, we will have, have to see. I mean, um, if we were able to successfully contain the virus before um, the flu season initiated potentially, we might not see a second wave. I didn't go much into this, but because it's controversial, but generally viruses circulate in, in the environment. And when another virus uh, happens to spread, the virus that was previously cir circulating uh, seems to come down. So we'll have to see if, uh, if we had a big flu outbreak, for example, if that would displace COVID. Um, we don't want that either, but, um, that could happen actually, because viruses do seem to have like a competition for their ecosystem as well.
Um, would children that have the feet rash and lesions, would that be contagious on the sand? Um, actually, the, 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 the lesions in the feet, um, to my knowledge, I'm not sure that there's any virus there or not. These, these lesions are caused by microcoagulation of the blood vessels because as we review the, the pathology, the virus tends to cause you know, what we call microthrombus, very microscopic clotting of blood vessels. Um, it is unknown if, if those uh, lesions are full of virus or not. From the uh, case reports I've seen, they have not been able to identify the virus in skin that was biopsy, but um, I think the risk would, would be fairly minimal. However, if those patients have the rash on their feet, they are they are likely have COVID, and the risk is really from the respiratory uh, source. That would be probably the biggest risk if they came into contact um, with anyone. Is it necessary to air out spaces after a positive person is in the room? How do droplets persist? How long do droplets persist? Well, that's a good question as well. Um, you know, this is uh, droplet spread. And so um, the virus doesn't really stay much in the air. It tends to fall into surfaces and it can stay on surfaces depending on the type of surface for longer periods of time. There have been some reports saying that the virus could be in the air for maybe 10 minutes or not, but, but other reports have said that the virus rapidly falls um, to, to, cell, to surfaces and, and that's where the virus would stay. It's generally not a virus that is aerosolized. For example, measles viruses, and that's why it's extremely, extremely um, infectious. It stays in the air, but this virus is, these are larger droplets and so they tend to fall onto surfaces. Uh, my son is asthmatic. Should he be put on a nebulizer immediately if he has cold-like symptoms? Uh, in general, for, for children who have asthma, um, the recommendations are that children with asthma should, should follow their standard procedures if they have any respiratory um, infection. And, and uh, certainly it'd be a good idea to talk to, to the pediatrician, to the person who accompanies uh, children who, who develop um, asthma symptoms, you know, and uh, presumably any, uh, any asthmatic reaction should, should receive treatment anyway. So it's, it's important to remember that sometimes uh, respiratory infections will trigger asthma uh, attacks. So in this era of COVID, we should have a higher awareness that if you're having severe asthma, potentially an exacerbation of respiratory symptoms, it would be a probably advisable to, to check um, for COVID infection as well. Should college students get the flu shot before returning to school as opposed to waiting until September or October to get it? Um, well, one of the issues is that the influenza vaccine is generally not available until early September for delivery to students. Uh, um, you know, influenza is a virus that mutates dramatically from year to year. It's actually very different for, from COVID. And so um, the vaccine is, is manufactured. It's, it's, it's tailored based on influenza infections that happen in countries in the southern hemisphere to predict what will be circulating in the northern hemisphere, you know, uh, months later. So, so it's, it's hard to develop a vaccine now that would be effective if, if influenza vaccine is developed too early in the year, um, it might not be as effective because they might not be able to um, identify which are the strains that are circulating. So they need to actually have an idea of what is circulating between June to August in the Southern Hemisphere to actually develop a vaccine that will be effective in protecting the northern hemisphere, and that's and that's how it goes from hemisphere to hemisphere, and so forth. Making the influenza vaccine too early might not be helpful in, in identifying a good vaccine um, for the season. Um, having said that, also the uh, in, immunity to influenza um, wanes very quickly. When you get the vaccine, it doesn't stay for years and years. So if you get the vaccine, maybe too many months, like eight or nine months um, before. Uh, the outbreak, the vac by the time that you are faced with the outbreak, you might not have as good as an immunity as if you had gotten the vaccine before. 
So what do you recommend to parents of a three-year-old who are thinking of having their child return to daycare now? Well, I, I believe that, well, daycare is necessary, right? Parents have to go back to work. We are easing off um, some of the restrictions, um, the social restrictions, the isolation policies here in California, and uh, it'll be necessary for children um, to return to daycare, to return to school. And uh, it, I think it is important to talk to the daycare center to make sure that they have um, some policy in place to, to, to some degree, separate the children if possible, to wash hands more frequently, to sterilize the toys and things like that. Um, I don't think that children should not return to daycare if, if the daycares become available. Having said that, it's not feasible for children to be wearing a mask 24 seven or wash, to wash their hands five, every five minutes. So um, there has to be some discussion about what is the best way of protecting children in that scenario. What are your thoughts about letting children swim in public schools during the summer season? Um, fortunately, um, most public pools have high levels of chlorine or um, disinfectants, which should be able to uh, kill the virus. So in that sense, um, the water should not be contagious to other individuals. Uh, I mean, we would, we don't unfortunately have a test that we can test everyone every day um, to let them allow to congregate. I think the biggest risk in public swimming pools, it would be the biggest risk of going to school or any other activity where there are a lot of young people together. Not much, not as much the water, but really, you know, people being in groups uh, and, and, and leading to transmission. But we'll have to see what, what you know, the LA Health Department tells us in the number of cases and how they're dropping or not in LA before we make uh, any of these decisions. But I do think the chlorine in the water should, should suffice to, to kill the virus. Thank you. Are there any final questions as we wrap up? Thank you. It's a pleasure to talking to you. I'm sorry that we can't see each other, but sort of, but nice talking to all of you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Nielsen, for that informative presentation. You know, we're all experiencing new issues right now, so it's nice to have this opportunity to learn about ways to support our children. And thank you all for joining us today and being open to this experience. Our next presentation will be on, thur on Thursday, the 28th. It will be led by Dr. Tina Bryson, who is the co-author with Dan Siegel of two New York Times bestsellers, uh, the whole whole brain child, sorry, and the no drama discipline. She will be providing insights into parenting during COVID-19. Please feel free to contact me with any questions. You can follow Chip on social media and check out our website, mychip.org. We wish you and your family's health and wellness during these challenging times. And thank you again, Dr. Nielsen. You've given us a lot to think about and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have a great day.